Baker here, lead present. And time to catch the roundabout. Hey, you want to catch a movie? No. Uh, soundtrack, movie soundtracks. Yeah, that's going to be the thing right now. Social discussion about you know, uh, now very important well, totally. topic. We've agreed that there are way too many soundtracks and cool things to talk about. So we'll just talk about some today. Just so yeah. we like conversationally and, cool. Yeah, and, and what we uh, what we mentioned before. So we will focus on the ones that are kind of uh, uh, that are done by artists rather than just uh, movie uh, composers. Although so, they so are we, becoming, we are, not, we are not going to focus on uh, like people like Bernard Herrmann and uh, well, we don't you know, have and Bill it. Conti and like anybody from. Uh, but guys like but, but guys like Hans Zimmer are becoming rock stars. They are touring. Doing oh, stadiums, yeah, yeah, in a way. I mean, and like, Johnny Marr from the Smiths, Joe is, Hisashi is, also. is playing lead guitar in the in uh-huh. the concert. So I'm saying, soundtrack life is changing. Oh yes, actually, that, that industry is changing. Hans Zimmer, <laughs> I mean, think about it. Like he did, I mean, he did like you know, um, in, like Interstellar won some kind of award. But I'm saying his method of working on stuff, people are more getting into than not, and and. Just to be uh, noted. He influenced so many people. I mean, he influenced much beyond uh, movie composers. He influenced artists as well. Yeah. He collaborated with artists. And he, uh, I don't know how many he scored. I mean, he's, Too many. He did and, uh, the Blade Runner soundtrack. I mean, which the, I was going to mention. Senior, uh, uh, Vangelis did yeah, that. Vangelis did uh, the uh, original, that, but he... Which, he, which is actually, oh, that, that, that's such a great uh, reference. That's a great moment. reference. It's, a it's killer, it's killer kind of, uh, score. I call it almost like a jammy soundtrack, which is so amazing and so fitting to to what it is. And then when you listen to the Blade Runner theme, yeah. it came out from jamming. I yep. mean, he really he improvised and he kind of it was really players uh, players thing rather than uh, than just uh, just kind of writing to picture. It was like out of cliches, uh, I would say. Right now, I mean, there are so many amazing uh, soundtracks, amazing compositions, but. Uh, there's a lot of it that is kind of uh, following the, the the patterns, so like kind of there are, there are certain kinds of themes that uh, that sell and uh, and people kind of go and uh, compose uh, kind of per project uh, to satisfy the the form in a way you know I mean there there's so much of great stuff you know but mm-hmm. I guess music influences other music so that's 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 what it's about I, I, what I want to say like before. I think it was much more. Uh, you didn't know what to expect. Now, when you start listening to the album, you kind of expect uh, like certain sound, and you you get certain sound. You know? Maybe slightly different melodies, but you get uh, you, you you get less surprised than you used. To. Well, there's good. There's there's. I mean, it's almost like to, just for this podcast purposes. It's not really mentioning who's the best or whatever. It's like what ones do you well, remember? Then you we say, don't talk about the ones that moved us, and that, that, like, hopefully cool. we will uh, we will uh, inspire somebody. But one thing I think it's it's good uh, good place to start is Mike Oldfield and Tobias <laughs> yeah. Bells. Unbelievable! Such a, such a great example, actually. What oh. what a soundtrack can do for an album, and it's such a I think it's probably the most uh, significant example it's, because. Oh. Oh. To Bill Bells. Because it really kind of, uh, I mean, because it, uh, it was used in Exorcist and the uh, movie picked up and it became so big and it was so connected with uh, what it meant in a movie. A record picked up, like, sold, like, in <laughs> unimaginable numbers, you know. and uh, Deservedly so. Absolutely. Uh, amazing. And then he, I mean, it became his kind of life 
legacy, you know. It did such a Every, su such an amazing album. Like there's a live version, like old live version, new live version, like second, third, <laughs> like everything connected. Like he he's been doing that, and it's great. I think it's such a uh, you know some people can be cursed by their success, like by compositions, but I think he's so blessed because it's such a great thing he to did. revisit, you know. I think it's something to be the most proud of. You know? He's so an like, interesting musician altogether, but another soundtrack he did that was really good was The Killing Fields. Oh, yes. Oh, so wonderful. I, the theme is in my mind. Right? It's it's a, it's a an eerie movie so, that needed, um, needed to be carefully treated so you remember it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking mass murder, genocide, nuts, from Pol Pot, yeah, and then the with a guy, kind of with a theme, theme on top of that. a theme of a guy yeah. helping a guy. You know, not yeah, the concept of not leaving yeah. people behind mm -hmm. and not forgetting about them. Mike Goldfield was perfect for that, and that's why I thought Mike Goldfield was great in scoring the 2012 Olympics. Yeah. Musical <laughs> director, and and I, I wasn't lost on me. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know what? Why can't they have the Olympics in London all the time? They <laughs> seem to have the best music going on, the best, the best. But hey, that's my subjective that's opinion. Great. Get mad at me about it, but the music was good. Mike Oldfield. Mike Oldfield, and we share a lot for Mike Oldfield. We we talk about many of his yep. song driven albums as well. So he's 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 yep. great all around. But the guys so like, important. but when you watch movies, like I have a greater when you're growing up, you have a great appreciation in time. You have to for Ennio Morricone, mm -hmm. for uh, Jerry Goldsmith, Lalo Schifrin, guys that make movies you don't forget. Every time I see Enter the Dragon, I can remember like every scene musically. Um, and just like with Ennio Morricone, it's funny. Know the guy's whole catalog. I've listened to you know all these mm -hmm. like multi. Yes. And then the the one I keep going back to is not even his best. And that's how we are as people. The movie The Mission, with Robert De Niro and Jeremy Irons. And it was a, it was a movie about uh, you know the Catholic Church conquering and civilizing the natives, and then withdrawing on them and saying ah you know what we're just going to take over. We don't really need to turn you guys into Christians, and. The music that he wrote is very gentle with flutes and all this stuff out in the forest and the jungle. And then um, when they when they are going through the jungle with the troops, you're like jing, 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 with the flutes, do mm -hmm. do. Like he has a he's a master. And you, I don't care if you watch Once Upon a Time in the West or anything else, he's a master. Yeah, right. Or the bad, the ugly. That's his. <laughs> you know, and you and so movies like like give you some contrast. When I'm a kid, when I'm in, in New York City, one of the most violent movies to see when you're young would be like Death Wish. And then all of a sudden you're like, what? Herbie Hancock made the soundtrack to Death Wish? I think it's so cool that he challenged himself to say, yeah, you know what? I'll do the soundtrack because he made he had made Blow Up, but mm -hmm. then he, then he, then Space goes by and he goes, okay, I'll do this. And he uses synthesizers and he's very effective, big scoring. But in Hollywood, they do such a bad job with gaps because that's how you get... So then you got... So Death Wish is early 70s. They don't make Death Wish 2 until like 1982. And they go, hey, Jimmy Page, you don't do soundtracks. But by the way, do you want to do a soundtrack? And it was okay. And I remember there was a radio station that took one of the songs from mm -hmm. yeah. Death Wish 2 yeah. called Jam Sandwich. And, you know, all together, it was okay. But it was, um, sometimes you, you'll notice a soundtrack because you like the musician. Mm -hmm. Or you, oh, he did the soundtrack. I'll listen to it. I don't think that's bad. Now, sometimes it's a good soundtrack or a bad soundtrack. Only you know and I know. So I, uh, the Final Come Down, Grant Green made that soundtrack. One of my favorite jazz guitar players. It's like his later funky commercial period. Uh, wasn't the greatest movie ever made. Soundtrack wasn't amazing, but you're almost attracted to it and go, ah, you know what, I want to listen to that. So soundtracks bring back memory of the visual. Mm -hmm. And we're always kind of chasing these things. We were talking earlier today about... People are obsessed with, obviously, Radiohead, but more on the soundtrack side. I'm really mm -hmm. impressed with the amount of scores that Johnny Greenwood is doing for mm -hmm. movies. He started with a There Will Be Blood as far as a bigger thing back in mm -hmm. like 2007, 2008 with Daniel Day-Lewis. Mm -hmm. Now, if you turn on Netflix today, you're going to see uh, uh, The Blood of the Dog or whatever it's called. You're going to see Sp uh, this Spencer about, about Princess Diana mm -hmm. and... You could just go back a few movies and just say, wow, he knows how to score movies and he's very good at it. He's not, it's not something that he's forcing himself to do. And for the Spencer soundtrack, I was playing it in the car yesterday. I was like, oh, let me check this out. He, ha he does all his string instruments and then he puts jazz instruments in there. And what mm -hmm. he's trying to do is make the, the jazz creep and fight against the classical. 
just showing the counter of the Diana to the royal culture. How do you do that in music and make it enjoyable or interesting? I felt like he did it when I was listening to it. You seem to really dig the uh, the Tom Suspiro, York Suspiro yeah. soundtrack. I what do you think? It. Actually, I just I listened to it today. Actually, you 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 mentioned it. I I knew about the movie, but I haven't seen it. And uh, and today I listened to a soundtrack on its own. So it doesn't for me. I don't marry it to a picture. For me, it's just a piece of music that. But uh, you liked it that way. That's I, good. I enjoyed it so much. And, and so many uh, actually soundtracks I listened to that way. So it's uh, actually most of my life I listened to them kind of separately, like as records. And then right. you know you would notice certain ones in the movies. And then there are certain movies that kind of. You you want to find soundtrack, you know, because you heard songs in the movie. Actually, I have one in mind. What? And uh, there was more with the Warriors. Yeah, like yeah, New yeah, York yeah, yeah, yeah. Gangs and ends with a Joe Walsh song. How could you go yeah, wrong? In the city. Oh man, like that's. Uh, <laughs> and then that, that actually ended up on a, the Eagles album. And it's a Joe Walsh song, but it's. But it's okay. They like Joe. Yeah, yeah. We're and gonna make a few yeah. dollars off it. Of you want to play it live? And it's such a great scene, actually, with uh, with Coney Island Beach, and they're going in a distance, and it's so so fits it. I mean, for me, that that song was really, uh, for me, it was that one. For example, was married to the to the visual. Sure. For me, and then when I listened to the Long Run album, then I kind of, I always had a picture in my mind of like well, of the scene, and there there are, there are yeah. many actually. Uh, yep. Uh, Jenny Raven, uh, how would I? Ganya Ray, how would I pronounce her name? The New York uh, singer and producer. She was uh, with the Ten Girl Drive band, and then she produced lots of things. Her song appeared uh, in cool. a movie. It's called uh, uh, "Love Is a Fire." Uh, her name is uh, Jenny Raven. It's like New York. Uh, she was also connected with CBGB scene, and uh, and produced. Lots of albums from late seventies to early eighties at the record labels and stuff. But amazing singer, such a raw, powerful rock singer. She had few solo albums with uh, Lou Reed as a guest and like few, <clears throat> few others. But uh, but her song was in the movie, so I discovered her through that movie. So right. I, you know, the, you discover so many different artists mm -hmm. in a movies. Through. Don't even have to be that good if the soundtrack's good. So in other words, oh, yes. so the score obviously for scoring, yeah, we could talk. Yeah, we could talk about like so. There's this film scores. You know, you know if a film score is good if you go back and listen to it more than once, which we're talking oh, yes, about, absolutely. right? Yeah. Like I, there's ones I'll go and listen and say, yep, I'm I'm gonna check this out. And uh, like we you said, Bernard Herman, I listen to the Taxi Driver soundtrack mm -hmm. here and there because it's well done. It's and, his last and it's effort, very, and it's very kind of fun. Not. Uh, not his typical soundtrack. No, so it's, it's good. I, I actually noticed that we talked a few months ago about uh, that one, and, and I saw a Taxi Driver after so many years, and that's the first time I actually noticed the soundtrack, and I noticed okay. that Bernard Roman was. Uh, so when we talked about it, it was so so fresh and and made sense, and it's such such an unusual soundtrack. I think for me, the last time I saw Taxi Driver, the significance of it was uh, actually. Uh, Listening to the soundtrack and how, uh, listening to the music and how uh, how well it matched uh, the movie. It's such a heavy movie, actually. <laughs> like well, when movies heavy. come out and they like bands or sometimes they borrow a a song from a band that's already on an album mm -hmm. and that's not so original. But sometimes bands just make a song mm -hmm. yeah. for the movie. So there was or a movie called FM. Steely Dan made the oh, yeah, no, FM, no static yeah. at all. <laughs> That soundtrack was uh -huh. good, but then I remember the movie Heavy Metal, based on the magazine. Oh, yeah. well, I had the record. Dude, of Mob so Rules. You were like Mob this. Rules. I was like this. Na what? Nazareth had, had a song that uh, that was Blue Eyes the Cult was, was on the Blue Eyes the of the Psychic Poets. Better than Psychic was was on the the album um, uh, I'm, uh, Fire of an Origin, but it got kind of spotlighted uh -huh. on that movie, and Don Felder out of yeah, the yeah, Eagles yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Heavy. Metal, boom, yeah. and boom. And then you had uh, Sammy Hager. <laughs> Sammy Hager, heavy metal. You were like, okay, wow, I got two versions of heavy metal. How wonderful. So movies like that were creeping along. Fast Times from Ridgemont High, a lot of people loved that movie. And it had, you know, Cheap Trick and, and uh, The Cars. And there were all these yeah. scenes where you could match the songs to. And you were like, oh, okay, I like that. And that kept going through the 80s yeah. like that. You had Streets of Fire also by Walter Hill, just like Warrior. Which the had Warriors. the fix. It had the fix, you know, and, yeah. and it had a few original songs. And That was a great soundtrack. Yeah. And, Fire, and, I and see whatever that they called them. <laughs> now, in the 80s, movie, like, okay, so soundtrack I, I, I run back to 
would be soundtracks. The director, Alex Cox, kind of like making these cool counterculture movies, punk-based. He made uh, Sid and Nancy, mm-hmm. Love Kills. I saw that in the theater. I loved the soundtrack because it had songs from Joe Strummer. It had uh, Pray for Rain doing these instrumental songs, mm-hmm. songs from the Circle Jerks, a song from Steve mm-hmm. Jones, and the Pogues. It was an eclectic thing. So when you see the movie, you remember the songs. I'm like, I love the Sid and Nancy soundtrack. He did another soundtrack for uh, Repo Man. Repo Man mm-hmm. was uh, very much more a West Coast movie in um, you know L.A.-based punk. And had Emilio Estevez, the uh, less successful of the Sheen no, brothers. But no. that, but back then, you didn't think that. You see that movie, there were songs from the Circle Jerks, mm-hmm. Black Flag, right? And oh, yeah. mm-hmm. and just that Iggy Pop. And just that, you just got to see, it was there was no Britishness on that album. It was all America punk mm-hmm. stuff. Oh, good. And now to connect with Emilio Estevez, like, that's a very interesting. There was a movie called Maximum Overdrive. Not really a great movie, you know, about machines Uh-oh. going... Uh-oh. But ACDC. ACDC. So. <laughs> so that's a connection. You know? Was <laughs> he in Maximum Overdrive? And I, I admit, that was one uh, one of my uh, teenage collection movies. See? I had it on VHS, taped, you know, from TV. Be- because as long as a movie soundtrack is bringing... If it brings newer songs on, man, you feel like you got to have it. The mm-hmm. stupid movie, The Fly. I mean, it was a good movie, but there was a Brian Ferry song on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Help me. I loved it. I think he hated it, but I liked it. That's a good movie. Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. Yep. That's a, and then that movie. <laughs> I like, I like his, 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 his right? bizarre movies. <laughs> and, the, and, 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 the, and the movie Legend with Tom Cruise. Tangerine Dream does the score. David Gilmore's on the song with Brian Ferry. Is your love strong enough? Oh, my God. He's in the video. Gilmore and Ferry in the same video with the guitars. Who's who's gonna poo poo that, dude? Awesome. And then towards the end of the soundtrack, John Anderson. Love by the sun. I mean, so I'm sitting there. And so the movie's memorable. It's almost like you'd want to maybe not like that movie because you'd be like, oh, it's too too fairyland. But as you watch it, Tom Cruise is okay. Uh, Tim Curry playing the devil. But Tangerine Dream kind of ties it all together, mm-hmm. and you love it when those songs get dropped in. You Man, love it. It's, it's great, Nanovi. No, no, there's so, so many examples. And, and then we, we are not talking about ones like like The Wall and uh, Tommy and the things like that. Which are rock, more, which are which more, are, hey, I'm like a band. A rock, with it. Yeah. yeah, I made a movie, because they already had the album. Uh, but a good example of uh, the band getting kind of hired to score for a movie, and I think uh, that kind of, Synced with their album is Queen and the Highlander. Also was part of my teenage. You're not even going to mention that's Flash good, Gordon. Oh, that, that's a but not not as uh, Flash. Not, not as good as this. Ah. <laughs> kind of, for me, for my uh, taste and sensibility. Okay. Dude, Maybe Flash I'm, Flash was too good, man. Um, the guy who played Flash Gordon had a very like not so great there career was, after that. Uh, there was a documentary about. Yeah, I saw it. You oh, saw it too. Like we, Tell me that wasn't awesome. Because we consume uh, a lot of. <laughs> oh my god! I actually saw the trailer and I didn't see the entire movie. And you know what was in that movie that. too? Timothy Dalton, one of the James uh, Bonds, James was in that movie. But did anyone go crazy giving him credit? No. Why? Because people are losers. That's why. So, Which one? <laughs> you know, t- Timothy Dalton is in the movie, and, I, and then, he, then later, like how many years later? Ten years later, he's like James Bond. Less than ten years later. And I'm like, we're not going to pay any You're respect. From Flash. <laughs> yeah, you're going to pay any respect. <laughs> Timothy Dalton actually was in a lot of movies, but mm-hmm. you know, everything's whatever Hollywood thinks. If you're a great yeah, stage but, actor but and the, you're in good mm-hmm. movies, only if Hollywood yeah, thinks you're that, good. That's that, and they that's and they love Pierce Bronson, so that's why he got the spotlight, and that dude didn't. But soundtracks like are fun, right? We're talking mm-hmm. about this in a very fun way because we it's very enjoyable, right? Yeah. So like when you move to another decade. You know what was a really successful one that might not have been totally... My, that movie, Singles, was like a perfect grunt, ode to grunge love letter. It had Pearl Jam, it had Soundgarden, it had mm-hmm. everybody on it. And everybody loved that soundtrack. The movie was like, okay. Mm-hmm. But movie where soundtrack and movie are okay for me, Trainspotting. Mm-hmm. So Trainspotting was, uh, was a great way to just throw all these interesting songs together. But taking something old from Brian Eno... Digging into electronica like underworld, mm-hmm. then digging Iggy Pop as far as retro, digging in all this other stuff, and it made it, the the total product of the music was exciting. Joy Division, New Water, mm-hmm. 
Because there was a little new, a little old, and a little retro, but it made you think of people taking drugs in, in freaking Scotland, and you were like, cool. And what, what at the time, I remember buying the soundtrack, and I remember um, saying, oh, I didn't see the movie yet. Mm -hmm. So then I remember, like, it turned on the radio, and they had, like, political things, and he had... Bob Dole's a man that doesn't watch movies like Train Spotting, and you should. And I'm like, oh wow, he doesn't like it. I guess. And then he didn't see it. And I'm like, oh, maybe I'll see it just for fun, or whatever. And then I'm like, okay, depressing topic, but good music. Then a movie, uh, Lost Highway, which is a David Lynch movie, mm -hmm. and that movie, uh, that that soundtrack had like Nine Inch Nails. It had um, a, a Lou Reed song to it. It had um, oh, what the freaking is that band? Um, Smashing Pumpkins. It had a, a Ramstein. It had like mm -hmm. a lot of different things going on, and as well as a David Lynch thing is always mm -hmm. going to be eclectic. It would, that was a good soundtrack, mm -hmm. interesting movie. I don't need a movie to be perfect. Just please be interesting. And if you got good music, that's fine. And then you know, talking about marrying sound to to a picture, I think Quentin Tarantino is a great example. Yeah, I think he really uh, he has his vision of what he uh, what he wants to achieve with the movie. I think he has very distinct. Uh, uh, music taste and then also he works with a music supervisor called Mary Ramos and I think yeah. she, she does most of his uh, his projects so I think they they probably work really well um, well together and the mark that these soundtracks leave are is Dead incredible now mm -hmm. you saying this I'm gonna ask you mm -hmm. did you see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood I haven't man there's two scenes that you're just gonna dig because now you'll see it so one is one I won't say the scene but this obviously deals with like Charles Manson and stuff like that mm -hmm. and they play Vanilla Fudge in such a dramatic way where the guy goes in with a gun you don't believe me baby you oh. just keep and if they dra they dramatize it so much in the scene that oh, you're like that, that, that's great. but better than that, that that's just what, what the song uh, was aiming for and then I you mean, got uh, Vanilla Fudge is such a great example we're gonna leave that for our Covers episode of oh, Vanilla Fudge or the and, leaders and, of and great better than that. Covers, yeah. <laughs> better than that. I mean, I'm watching the. It was an interestingly made movie, but the one that because the soundtrack was older '60s music mm -hmm. of that time, and there's a scene where like Brad Pitt and DiCaprio are driving, and a Kentucky woman from Deep Purple, uh, uh, and you're like, you're like, <laughs> oh, yeah, actually, I know that it, it appeared in the movie. I, I know because, and I, you're like, cool. I. Uh, I followed that uh, Deep Purple uh, website, High Vista. Right. It's Deep Purple. And instead Thanks. of using Highway you, Star or Speed King, yeah. they use yeah. that. <laughs> right? When they're driving a car fast, you're like, good. You picked that, that song. So with those kind of things, like, like so Tarantino's thing is to just dig into the old record collection and throw things onto a soundtrack yeah, in an that's interesting way. That, that, that means to him. You know, that, that, that's, that's, that's what he really did a great to. job. I, I found it interesting for Pulp Fiction that they remade uh, the, the, the Neil Diamond song, Girl, Nair, Nair, Nair. I mean, mm -hmm. he could have used the original in that case, but he gave Urge Overkill, a band of mm -hmm. the 90s, an interesting opportunity to remake and but it worked. Really, I mean, that version really worked. I mean, sometimes you, have, you have covers sometimes that, uh, that are used in movies because of necessity, because yeah. in order to... Uh, sing song from uh, you know Beatles. You have to pay a million dollars. So if you want to get a sound alike or cover, you know you have much different uh, different uh, rate. And I mean probably for the Beatles, it still goes up. You know because they have to give their uh, uh, like their approval. You know so probably they, they go with it. But uh, many bands don't are not that territorial with it. So if you do a cover of certain band, you can you know license it for you know I guess few thousand instead of hundred thousand or or more so i think i think these are the reasons in many cases but i think in this case i mean i don't know i don't know the story behind it but actual cover version worked so well i mean maybe maybe even better than the original would, would have worked in. i mean it, it really but what really matters is like how it how it sinks to the picture i guess that's the that's the priority for <laughs> this but this there, there's movies where someone else we like who does Who's not even? I can't even categorize him to some extent, but Ryushi Sakamoto, he's mm -hmm. everything. No, he's, he's, he's like this. Crazy. Look, I'm a pop musician. Look, I'm I'm scoring a film. Yeah. Look, I made and, a classical uh, yeah. piece. Look, I did this visual. And Yellow Magic Orchestra. Which he's is all over the place. Yeah. So what I, what I found interesting about him as a as a musician and an actor, mm -hmm. hey, 
I, everybody's got their top movies. One of my top movies would be Last Emperor. Last Emperor, his soundtrack is very memorable. But I love the fact that he's like, nope, I'm going to be in the movie too. And he plays this ball-busting guy uh, on the Japanese side, oppressing the Chinese. And you're like, wait a minute, I'm really digging this soundtrack and feeling like he's, he's in touch with the situation. Hey, wait a minute, the guy in the mustache, he's a real jerk. Oh. So really, really well done that he did. He, he, you know, he created that movie. Then there's another movie he's in where he does the soundtrack with David Bowie. Uh, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. Mm -hmm. That movie was uh, strange in terms of a, of a prison camp movie because if you see like Bridge Over the River Choir of... Which has very nature. memorable the whistlings. <laughs> oh, dude. That's another one to... Bridge Over the River oh. Choir? What's the best the line? Whistlings. You've seen the movie, right? You've seen Bridge Over yeah, the River? Yeah. So, that, one of the greatest... And, and, that, and that whistle theme is... That stays. I mean, themes like that... Themes like that are... And I think uh, 70s had many more themes like that. That's probably what... Crazy. What really kind of draws me back to Good, 70s. bad, so the Of course, there, there's so much... Yeah. Great, great, uh, great example. Wah, wah. <laughs> Absolutely great example. I mean, then you have Mike Oldfield too. Then Thank you have John Carpenter and his movies. There's always that like theme that is really and John recognizable. Carpenter. It's not kind of you know, you know. I think now what uh, at least what I'm seeing. I'm sure there are amazing soundtracks, but from what is uh, kind of top uh, money making su successful movies, it's uh, there are many like I think kind of originality is, is lacking in a way with many uh, with many artists and composers because there are many projects where uh, people are asked to create sound alike music so kind of yes. give me something in a in a spirit of this and there are many amazing musicians that, that can do that but like you can feel that even when it's done on like on the highest production level you know you feel that okay this is something that kind of is aiming to sound like project. For example, I, I slightly compose. I, I mean, even like if, if you, I mean, Suspira is great, but when you think about influences, about certain moods that kind of, I'm, I'm sure uh, would influence this, it's uh, Icelandic composers. It's, uh, I think what's what's happening in the last like 10, 15 years, they really branded well and the music is so unique and so kind of dark in a way, but there are so many people that kind of, uh, kind of, are influenced and in a way kind of imitate the the sound of the right like and kind of uh, style of composition you know style of production you know where like things are kind of comp compressed in a way that uh, you know you're almost uh, kind of underwater you know <laughs> I mean if you know when you listen to when you listen to certain newer soundtrack music you get that kind of vibe like it's like similar kind of mastering, similar right. kind of sound. It's like because kind they're of, making them very kind of fast. Vacuum. It's kind of vacuumed in, in a way, lots of things. And it's because of, uh, you know, artistically, that's the sound that, that they're aiming for. And mass, you know, to, and mass <laughs> production. To, they got to move, they got to crank so, them out. Yeah. Trent Reznor also uh, got mm -hmm. more of the soundtracks. That, that, like, for instance, the uh, multi-part Vietnam series they did in 2017. He did the full mm -hmm. soundtrack with that, yeah. that other Atticus dude. That that was you know that made it memorable because oh he fit in like hand in glove dark topic, you know the the right kind of, and but he's done a lot of different musics now it's to a point where I, I was younger I loved Button Nine Inch Nails even when they first came out I was all into that album, following their career I'm almost at a phase where I'm like oh wow I can't wait for the next soundtrack besides before a Nine Inch Nails album just because he's delivered quality stuff, and he's found his way so I think soundtrack guys find their way into things or out of things that some people touch and go. They make a soundtrack, they don't make one for years and they keep making them. But if the, if the music doesn't draw you to it, you won't, you'll forget about it. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just keeping in mind where we have everything on demand and streamable, mm -hmm. like what are we seeking out? And I'm always going back to even things like 2001 A Space Odyssey. That's mm -hmm. an easy one, the Gear no, Gore, Ligeti, right? And, but then uh, Wendy Carlos, who did, um, uh, what am I want to, I want to say, oh, Clockwork Orange. Mm -hmm. Who also did like The Shining? You'll, you'll, I'll touch in for bits of that, or I'll mm -hmm. make little playlists of oh, let me make weird. There, there's always um, Brian Eno makes mm -hmm. the soundtrack, or people put him on soundtracks. Mm -hmm. So, for people that, have, that don't really get into that type of world, we recommend that you do. 
No. So go dig around, find a soundtrack, see what you like about it, or find one with a lot of songs on it, play it, like party in your apartment, yeah. whatever. If it connects you to something else, some new music, then great. If it, and if we inspired you to discover something new, that's great, that's what we are here for. Right, and we're not even going to mention Ian Gillen on the Jesus Christ Superstar soundtrack uh, as a close here. No, I mean, it's a sound, it's, it's actually, uh, that, that is, uh, it, it's... Uh, play version it's, it's, right uh, it's a play it, that became a, a movie T Ted Neely was the one that, right that's, that's the one that he still kind of carries his, right it still carries his uh, career now but we have to we have to leave that for one episode and we of do. course Roger Glover and the butterfly ball like, <laughs> come on people it's like get with the program yes. people yeah Roger get James with it Dio and his uh, his we, contributions there. we're not gonna burn everybody out we're just gonna leave you wanting more and um, you know check out some soundtracks until the next episode of Catch the roundabout!